Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started here. I'm so happy to welcome you tonight. It's wonderful to have this um, fabulous crowd here. My name is Karen Gillenwater. I'm the museum manager here at 21C Museum Hotel Louisville, and I'm thrilled that we're here at our second New Lens for this year, and I'm so excited to hear members of Bourbon Baroque playing the music of Philip Glass, and so excited to have all of you here for that experience with us. So thank you for coming. Please come for the, the next ones, um, and after the show, you're welcome to take a look around at our exhibits and enjoy the art. So thank you, and I'm happy to introduce Daniel Gillen. I'm from Louisville Public Media. Thank you. We got one applause. All right. <laughs> it's for you, Karen. It's for you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Daniel Gillum. I'm from WUOL, a part of Louisville Public Media. Uh, we've got members of Louisville Public Media here today, I think, maybe. A few. I don't know. Good. Good. Okay. Awesome. Um, uh, how, for how many of you, this is your first New Lens concert here at 21C? Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, wonderful. It's always good to see new faces. Um, please come back. Um, our next one is in August. It's next month, but it will not be here. Uh, it will be at Louisville Public Media. I'll tell you more about that at the end of this show. But um, so happy to have members of Bourbon Baroque here uh, to play the music of Philip Glass. Um, it's one of those things that you come up with this weird idea and then, you know, Alice and I are friends and I said, what do you think about, what would, you know, what would happen if you guys played Philip Glass? And she was like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. And um, that's how things happen sometimes. You just mention something and then everybody's game. Um, so, uh, you know, Philip Glass is this early uh, pioneer in minimalist music. Um, and if you've uh, you know, ever watched a movie, there's a good chance you've heard music by Philip Glass. Not only has he written music specifically for films, uh, like The Truman Show or The Hours, um, but he's also, his music has also been licensed a lot for music, so for movies, so you probably heard it at some point. Um, and if you've not heard the music of Philip Glass before, I think once you hear it played, you'll go, oh yeah, I kind of, this sounds kind of familiar. Um, he has a very distinct style that, um, you know, it, it's, it's a, I think, an understatement to say it's repetitive, or it's inaccurate to say it's repetitive. It shifts, it moves, it has a, a slow um, metabolic rate as opposed to something that, that moves quickly and fastly. Um, but it's beautiful, it's engaging, and it gives you just a chance to reflect on the music. So um, the, the really interesting thing about Bourbon Baroque is that they play in a, uh, a historically informed style. So they play music from the 17th and 18th centuries in a way that those folks back in the 17th and 18th century probably would recognize it. It would sound very familiar to them with the kinds of instruments and the bows and the techniques that they played. So I'll let Alice talk more about that later in the program about how we've combined this Baroque style of playing with a 20th century minimalist composer named Philip Glass. Thank you all for being here and please welcome Bourbon Baroque. Thank you. 
Good evening. Before we play our next piece, we wanted to thank you for coming tonight to this concert. And um, we'll speak a little bit as we go through the program, but I just wanted to say a little bit about the next piece, Company. It was written for a string quartet. It's not an arrangement, and it's based on, it was commissioned as a setting of Samuel Beckett's novella, Company. You probably know Samuel Beckett more famously as the author of the play Waiting for Godot. And the subject of company is a man lying on his back musing on consciousness and life, going all the way back to Platonic thought. Um, and the writing of the music is a little bit more spare than the other things you might hear tonight. And see if, see if you think so. And it may reflect the spareness of Beckett's writing. And Beckett's novella ends with a feeling of hope of humans as the designer of their own life. So see if you think it ends accordingly.
Hi, I'm Alice. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit right now about um, our instruments and sort of what we're trying to do tonight. <laughs> um, so we are playing on historical instruments. Um, I think, Erica, you might have the oldest one here tonight. Yeah. What year is it? Though? late 19th century, so late 1800s. Um, and I think the rest of ours are replicas of historical instruments, but you know that could be considered more accurate because instruments from the 1730s were new in 1730, so. Um, which is the time of music we usually play on these instruments. <laughs> um, but Philip Glass really uh, begs for the same kind of resonance that our instruments are very natural at producing. So our instruments have more wood on them than a modern counterpart that you would see at the Louisville Orchestra or other sorts of concerts here maybe. Um, the neck on our instruments tends to be a little flatter, straight out as opposed to at a downward angle. And you might notice we don't mostly, you know, sort of a little bit of a here or there, especially with this music and, you know, the technique that's required to play this, which is a little bit different from what we use in the kind of technique we have to use for Baroque, but we generally don't use a chin rest or a shoulder rest. Um, and uh, I, I'm just gonna show the bow a little bit. So the bows are really what make uh, historical performance historical performance, in my opinion. If you, if you were gonna change one thing about your string playing, it would be to get a Baroque bow. You could play on your modern violin and it would make a really big difference. So. Those of you who know what a Baroque bow looks like, you might say, well, yeah, Erica's using her late Baroque bow. It has a very sort of pointy tip and it arches out up like this. And so um, Alice and Sarah and I, we're using also historical bows that may look kind of modern to you. These are in fact replicas. Mine even, even with this giant tip on it is um, a late uh, 18th century model. Um, so these allow us to do some techniques that uh, are harder on the modern bow, but also things that are easier on the modern bow are harder on these bows. <laughs> um, and so we, we each experimented in rehearsal with using a Baroque bow and using this slightly later bow. Um, and we sort of all picked our preference. So we're all using slightly different bows, but that also would be historically accurate if you're gonna call it that because Bows were not codified during the time period that we generally play anyway. That wasn't until later. So it's a little bit about our instruments. We also use gut strings, so we'll be tuning a lot because they are sensitive to humidity. <laughs> and um, there they are. Look at my notes here. Oh yeah. So we are also playing at, if you go to the Louisville Orchestra and you are there for the very beginning and the oboe gives the A, right? And then the whole orchestra tunes to the oboe. That is an A at 440 hertz. That's the generally accepted A. Um, it varies a few cents here and there, but if you go to Europe, it's about the same. Might be like 443 or 444. Um, <laughs> we play at A415, so that's a half step lower than 440. So that means that at A440, at your Louisville Orchestra A, our A is their G sharp. I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody, but we play a half step lower. But we just are tuned like that. We, we read the music the same, everything is exactly the same. Our strings are just tuned lower. And that's very normal for us. And we actually, as historical players, are used to tuning at a variety of pitches. We play all the way down at 392, which is a whole step below 440, all the way up to 466, which is a half step above 440, depending on what time period and what uh, country, <laughs> which what organ was in that town. But for this concert, we're playing at 450. Um, and so then, you know, Daniel mentioned earlier about some of other things we're trying to do here. Like what, what sort of decisions did we have to make in rehearsal to play this music on historical instruments? And um, I think sort of it boils down very generally to it was how we wanted to phrase things. And in historical playing, we tend to um, 
group things a lot, which this music lends itself to. <laughs> um, there are a lot of groupings in this music. And so uh, we're trained and we study and we read treatises that say, you know, you diminish a window over a, of a, over a slur every time. And that's very different from modern playing. Um, it's not wrong or right, it's, it's different. And, um, and so we had to think about that and then apply it to this music and see how it worked or didn't and then make adjustments from there. So we, we started from a historical standpoint and then played this music and then tried to make some decisions that would serve the music as, as best that we could serve it um, for this purpose. So uh, hope that you all enjoy the rest of the concert.
we historical performers like to talk to the audience a lot, so. <laughs> Here I am again. Um, so, um, I just wanted to sort of talk about the next piece. Um, Daniel alerted me to this piece. I didn't know about it. Um, and he was like, oh, you're going to play quartet sots? And I was like, well, I don't know what that is. So, um, it turns out that the Kronos Quartet, which is a famous string quartet who has been Philip Glass's muse quartet <laughs> for, for all of time, kind of, um, they commissioned, I think, 50 works or something like that of various modern contemporary composers for sort of like educational purposes because a lot of very modern music is can be very out of reach for students in terms of the difficulty of it. Um, and so... That's not to say this piece is easy, <laughs> but um, in, in Baroque music, you know, a lot of Baroque repertoire is used in education as well. So like almost the entire first couple Suzuki books of violin training anyway are Baroque, right? Vivaldi. If anybody knows that one. Um, anyway, so a lot of Baroque music and... Um, but Baroque music is also so much more than just those little pieces, uh, little movements of small pieces in, you know, the educational repertoire. Um, and it's, it's so great to be able to perform another piece from a different era that is also can be used for this purpose. Um, all the music is great. Um, and like all the music in the Suzuki repertoire is great, but it's so great that there are other more new things and pieces and composers that um, students can become familiar with and even professionals who aren't aware of these people can play this music as well. Um, and so I think I did that better in our rehearsal, by the way. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so something off the topic of education is that in the Baroque period, there were um, key affects that were assigned to various keys, uh, key areas like A major, F major, or something like that. And this was sort of a universally known thing during the Baroque period. Like if you wrote a piece in a certain key, it was supposed to evoke um, melancholy or, or some, some mood, an affect is what we would call it. And so we were sort of talking amongst ourselves about this next quartet, and we thought, wow, this sort of seems really, like, pastoral, you know, and um, it was, like, very nature-y, and then we realized it's in F, and that is the pastoral key in the Baroque period. <laughs> so maybe you can imagine some bucolic scenes, um, some cattle. We saw some cute pictures of cows earlier, so uh, <laughs> some, some uh, shepherds. I don't know. Enjoy the next one.
So just one more talking point here. <laughs> um, we are just so pleased to be here today. We have been talking and thinking about this concert for like three plus years <laughs> in, uh, in various ways that it could be done. And um, I'm just so excited that it's happening and we're here and we're playing. Um, I got really into Philip Glass in undergrad at University of Michigan um, when I took a 20th century musicology class that was to that date the hardest class I'd ever taken and my professor spoke so quickly that I just typed every word and then tried to decipher it later. Um, <laughs> so, But I learned so much and I did a, a huge project on Philip Glass at the end of that class and um, I watched hours of um, his uh, you know, films that he composed for and listened to hours of his music. Um, Einstein on the Beach is still one of my favorite works by Philip Glass um, of all time. And um, a few years later, I got into historical performance, um, but still love Philip Glass, and so glad we're putting the two things together here. Uh, thank you to Daniel Gillum of WUOL uh, for having us here on the Newlands series, and for 21C for hosting, um, and for our wonderful homestay host, Brandon Craig, and my parents uh, also for hosting a musician, but uh, having us rehearse all week in their house. <laughs> um, and uh, lastly, thank you to you all for playing this concert with me, and I'm so glad we get to make music together. So um, enjoy the last piece, Mishima. Um, if you want to read anything about any of these Philip Glass works, there are very, very good descriptions about what the films are about on his website. So you can go there. Enjoy.
Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, thank you to 21C Museum Hotel and Karen Gillenwater for hosting us and partnering us with these wonderful New Lens concerts. Thanks to Eric Matthews running our sound today and Tyler Franklin who's shooting video. Um, and thank you to our listener members whose contributions make these events possible. Uh, the next New Lens is on August 14th. It's at Louisville Public Media in our performance studio. If you've never been to a radio station before, it's a two for, it's a two for one deal, right? A good concert and you get to see a radio station. You can find out more info about that concert on our website at wuol.org. We also have some free stuff in the back, uh, stickers, whatnot. Have a great evening. Thanks for coming. See you next time.